Today we are going to explain a war action thriller movie called The Siege of Jadaville. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Our story begins in Congo, where Prime Minister Lumumba is seated in a moving car. As Lumumba travels, the car ahead of them suddenly explodes. Protesters gather and soldiers pull Lumumba from his vehicle, subjecting him to torture before transporting him to an undisclosed location. There, a man named Shom, a general, emerges as the mastermind behind these events. Shom outlines his demands to Lumumba, but Lumumba refuses to comply, adamant that he cannot allow their country to be destroyed or their resources exploited. He reveals reveals his intention to send their production and goods abroad. Enraged, Shom signals his men, who fatally shoot Lumumba in the head. The scene then shifts to a United Nations meeting held in New York. O'Brien delivers a speech concerning the situation in Congo. He accuses various countries of remaining passive while Shom collaborates with mining companies to exert control over Katanga. O'Brien emphasizes the importance of sending more peacekeepers to the province, particularly in the wake of Prime Minister Lumumba's death. In an Irish pub, Quinlan engages in a conversation with a couple of his colleagues discussing Julius Caesar. He underscores the idea that politicians often lack an understanding of tactical warfare, while soldiers may not comprehend broader strategic concepts. However, Caesar possessed the unique ability to grasp and navigate both tactical and strategic aspects of warfare effectively. Foreman interjects with a sarcastic comment, playfully referring to Quinlan as Julius Caesar in a lighthearted tone. However, a sniper among them defends Quinlan, mentioning that he has extensive knowledge of battles and warfare strategies. Gorvin follows up by asking if Quinlan knows about the real thing. This time it's Prendergast who speaks up. He informs the group that Quinlan is their commanding officer. Meanwhile, at home, Quinlan is with Carmel when the phone rings. He receives instructions that he and his infantry will be deployed to Jedeville. Carmel teases him about being excited to go and wanting to prove his skills. They share a moment, slow dancing together, before Quinlan departs. Quinlan addresses his men before their deployment. He mentions that they are the second wave of Irish soldiers sent to Congo, and nine lives have already been lost. Lost. He advises them to take pride in their mission as peacekeepers, emphasizing that Ireland has never sought to conquer another nation. This is why they were specifically requested to assist Shomd. Quinlan also highlights the significance of their mission in maintaining peace and stability. Shomi faces the media, and with some confusion welcomes the UN forces, acknowledging that they don't fully understand why they are in Africa. However, he warns them not to cause trouble and assures them that they will learn how things are done in Congo. Hammerhold confides in O'Brien that he received calls from Khrushchev and Kennedy. They believe that the Congo situation can be diffused and request O'Brien to end Shom's actions. Hammerhold acknowledges that the one who can stop it will receive substantial credit. He promises to work on a plan and stresses that O'Brien's role is crucial in this historical moment. Worried, Shom asks General de Gaulle for assistance. De Gaulle directly questions what he will gain from helping, and Shom emphasizes the importance of keeping mining companies operational. If he loses power, the government may nationalize these resources, including those owned by de Gaulle personally. In return for his support, Shom pledges to send a thousand of his best former legionnaires, who will be hired as security by the mining companies but ultimately controlled by Shom. The troops arrive at a UN compound in Jadaville. Prendergast points out the vulnerability of their position, as they are exposed on three sides and lack proper cover. Quinlan acknowledges Prendergast's observation and orders the men to be ready by six in the morning for the next day. Meanwhile, O'Brien arrives in Katanga and meets with McKenty and Raja. At the UN headquarters in Katanga, O'Brien declares that Shom has crossed a line and must be stopped. He authorizes the immediate implementation of Operation Morther, taking aggressive action to reclaim key buildings held by Shom's forces. Given that Rage's soldiers have the most military experience, O'Brien hints that the others will look to them as an example of decisiveness. Quinlan decides it's time to gather supplies at a local shop. However, Madain Lafontaine boldly informs him that their troop is not welcome in Katanga. When he asks why, she points out that the people are unhappy with how things have unfolded, especially since Prime Minister Lumumba's time in power. She explains that Lumumba's decision to nationalize minerals and expel mining companies wasn't seen as very wise. In a local bar, some locals invite Quinlan to join them for a drink of French cognac. While they chat, Falk inquires about Quinlan's purpose in Katanga. Quinlan replies that he's there to protect the locals from a man who seized power. Fox, on the other hand, suggests that he's there to protect mining interests. Quinlan visits a house close to their compound, which is owned by Madame Lafontaine. He asks if he can use her phone to make a call to Ireland. Initially hesitant, she eventually allows him to make a personal call for his family. As Quinlan finishes his 
call, he learns from Madame Lafontaine that Jadaville holds the largest uranium deposits in the world. He realizes this is the reason they were deployed to this specific city in Congo. Back at the compound, Quinlan instructs Prendergast to go to Elizabeth Phil and inform McKenty that there's a substantial force of mercenaries in Jadaville. He emphasizes the need for reinforcements. Prendergast conveys this information to O'Brien, who believes that Quinlan may be overreacting. Prendergast relays the news of mercenaries in the city, and O'Brien assumes they were hired by the mining company. He reassures Prendergast that the situation will be resolved soon, but it's clear that Prendergast doesn't receive the response Quinlan had hoped for. On his way back to the compound, Prendergast notices an increase in mercenaries surrounding them. Roger reports that his troop was attacked by a security detail that then barricaded themselves in Radio Katanga. They planned to eliminate them with grenades, but tragically discovered too late that unarmed civilians were also in the building. O'Brien insists that it didn't happen and shouldn't be mentioned in any UN dispatches. As the UN troops observe mass, a sniper suddenly yells out that they are under attack. Falk quickly opens fire with his machine gun, and Quinlan orders everyone to assume their positions. Cooley criticizes Quinlan, expressing doubt about his leadership and accusing him of potentially getting them killed. Despite Quinlan's earlier orders to Prendergast and others to head for the south position where there are no visible enemies, Prendergast decides to board a truck and fire their machine gun. He manages to take down many mercenaries, prompting Falk to order the rest of the troops to retreat. The day ends with both sides preparing for the next attack. Falk points out that they were misinformed as they were told the UN troops were ill-prepared. He believes they are an easy target because they lack combat experience. In contrast, Quinlan readies his troops for a potential attack from all sides in the next encounter. Prendergast informs them that they only have 13,000 rounds of ammunition left, which won't last long. McKinney finally responds to their earlier request and Quinlan reports what transpired. He admonishes McKinney for not providing reinforcements after the initial request. O'Brien takes the phone and urges Quinlan not to panic. He dismisses the mercenaries as desperate individuals clinging to Shom's failing government. O'Brien ridicules Quinlan and advises him to stop making excuses for the mercenary's second attack. Quinlan orders the sniper to target a man in a white suit who appears to be associated with Sham. When asked if he thinks the man is important, Quinlan suggests they won't have to wait long to find out. Fox notices the man's absence and orders another retreat. He signals for a temporary truce and meets with Quinlan on the battlefield. Fox points out that they are outnumbered, suggesting that they let politicians resolve the situation. He advises Quinlan to surrender, but Quinlan refuses. Fox proposes a ceasefire to tend to the wounded and retrieve the dead, which Quinlan reluctantly agrees to. However, the ceasefire turns out to be a trap. Haggerty spots a soldier preparing to fire a rocket-propelled grenade, and the battle resumes. The mercenaries close in, and Quinlan's troops struggle to hold them back. A grenade falls close to Quinlan, but doesn't detonate. Joyce explains that it's a dud, and as he readies their own grenade, he successfully hits one of the enemy's jeeps carrying a mortar, setting off a chain reaction. Hammerhold, meanwhile, receives word about the casualties at Radio Katanga. He questions O'Brien's role, and his right-hand man reminds him that O'Brien is more of an academic who assumes everyone will wait for his decisions. Hammerhold acknowledges the need to address the situation but plans to distance themselves. When asked how, Hammerhold reveals their intention to assign blame elsewhere. O'Brien meets with Shom and expresses his desire to see an end to the conflict between the UN and Shom's loyalists in Katanga. Shom requests recognition as the legitimate president and his government is valid, but O'Brien deems it unrealistic. Shom reminds O'Brien of the Irish soldiers in the field and asserts that he hasn't forgotten about them. The following day, Quinlan's expected reinforcements come under attack. He learns that only 30 men were sent instead of the promised battalion. With dwindling ammunition and provisions, Quinlan questions how they are expected to continue fighting. While assessing their remaining supplies, Quinlan is injured when Fox accidentally shoots him in the shoulder with a sniper rifle. O'Brien suggests abandoning those in Jadaville since they can't provide support without risking more casualties. McKinney opposes this idea. Shortly after, they receive news that Hammerhold's plane was shot down by a jet controlled by Shom's forces. The troops try to contact McKinney but receive no response. Quinlan reluctantly acknowledges that if they wanted to help, they would have done so by now. As the enemy approaches again, Commandant Colin orders his men to gather enemy shells and set up explosive devices. The Irish soldiers await the enemy's arrival. When the enemy gets close, Commandant Colin orders the activation of the bombs, resulting in numerous casualties among the enemy ranks. The Irish soldiers seize the dead enemy's rifles and continue to resist as enemy forces keep growing. The UN compound faces heavy bombardment as the enemy fires missiles and mortar ammunition. The Irish soldiers halt their fire momentarily due to the fog surrounding the compound. Commandant Colin bravely stands and moves unarmed toward the enemy's position. Facing Fox, he surrenders and negotiates with Fox through a handshake. Minutes later, Commander Cullen asks his men if they should surrender, but they resolutely refuse, determined to fight until the end. While proud of their response, Commander Cullen decides to end the war against the mercenaries, given the circumstances. 
After several waves of attacks, the Irish soldiers failed to protect Jadaville and Shadowville due to a shortage of ammunition and a lack of assistance. They are subsequently held captive in Katanga prison for a month, awaiting their fate. Fortunately, they receive word that they will be sent back to Ireland. Upon landing in Ireland, Commandant Cullen is coldly welcomed by General McKinney. He learns that their efforts will be kept from the public for a few days. In Jadaville, Congo, Commandant Cullen angrily punches General McKinney when he threatens to court-martial him and the others for cowardice. The movie concludes with the Irish soldiers proudly standing and saluting Commandant Colon as he leaves to hug his wife. Subscribe to see more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.